Blending a course takes a lot of work and can seem overwhelming. This section of the presentation discusses ways to break the process down into manageable and achievable steps. In order to get the most bang for your buck, or the most positive impact on your course from the time you spend revising it, you want to make sure that any online elements you're adding further your goals for the course. Which means that if you haven't already, you need to start by articulating your goals for the course as precisely as you can. What is it you want this course to do for your students? What role, if any, does it play in your department's curriculum or the college's curriculum? It's usually fairly easy for faculty to describe their skill building and content goals for a course, such as, I want students to learn to effectively analyze and critique historical arguments, or after taking this course, students will be able to explain the meaning and importance of liberalism in a 19th century European context. However, we often forget about more effective goals, impacts that we want a course to have on how students feel, which can often be just as important. For example, a colleague who teaches students to use the coding language R for statistical analysis does so partly because it's a free open source tool that they'll have access to after they leave college, but also because he wants to demystify code and get students more comfortable with coding. Odds are you'll find that you have multiple goals for a course. Rather than trying to develop a blended approach that encompasses all of them, it's best to start by focusing on one or two that are either highest priority, clearly related, or most easily addressed by blended learning. To give an example, in the course Mineralogy and Crystal Chemistry mentioned in another video, the professor had two course goals that were in tension with one another. First, she wanted to improve students' retention of content information and the identification skills that they would need to make successful field and lab identifications. However, since this course was the gateway to the major, the first in a sequence that majors were required to take, she worried that all of the memorization and skill building involved would discourage potential majors and give them an overly negative impression of what research and careers in geology would entail. So she also wanted to connect the skill building and the content mastery to work, they, work that they were doing to real and exciting questions that geology, geologists explored. Blending the course served both of these goals. The online and visual identification quiz that she added not only gave students more opportunities to practice applying content knowledge and skills, but also moved much of that practice outside of class meetings. The professor then used the in-class time that was freed up to explore the more interesting ramifications of the things that students were learning, such as how the structural characteristics of certain minerals might be related to potential industrial uses, or to resistance to erosion. Another informative question to ask yourself is what are the pain points for this course? What do your students struggle with most? For example, let's say you teach a course involving essay exams and you're disappointed with the general quality of the essay responses, or you notice that a significant number of students really struggle with them. The flip side to the question of pain points is what are you as an instructor struggling with most? What pedagogical challenges are you facing? For example, with the example, the hypothetical case in the previous example, you might recognize that your students need more low stakes assessments to build on exam essay writing strategies and their skills, but given the size of the course, you wouldn't have time to grade these practice essays. Pain points can also be things about the course that simply aren't working. Students don't seem to be engaged with the material, for example, or class discussions are falling flat. Again, you probably might be able to identify multiple pain points. If so, see if you can pick one or two that would be most important to address, either because they are most pressing or they're the greatest barrier to achieving your course goals.
Now that you've articulated what you want to achieve and what you're up against, you can start thinking about how blended learning could help. This slide combines the four affordances of blended learning discussed in the video on Why Blend My Course with the four forms or variants of blended learning discussed in the video What is Blended Learning? If your course goals or pain points are related to engagement or student mastery, for example, if you want to interest students in a discipline, get them to take ownership of their learning, help make learning stick, or shift to a skills-based rather than a content-based approach to teaching, then incorporating active learning into your course can help. You might want to design the course around a digital project or flip your class. Or you might have tried flipping your class but discovered you need to add online assessment and feedback to ensure that students are understanding the material. Formative assessment can also help with a range of goals or pain points related to retention, learning outcomes, and the needs of diverse learners. In courses with a lot of group or collaborative activities, individual assessment can also give students who may not excel or whose contributions may not be visible in those contexts with an alternative means of demonstrating their learning. If your primary goals or pain points relate to enhancing the curriculum, giving students access to opportunities that aren't available locally, or offering courses in areas where the college does not have local expertise, then any of these forms of blended learning might serve. It's worth recognizing that blended learning isn't a panacea. You might have goals and pain points that aren't easily addressed by incorporating digital technology into a course. Or, more commonly, the scale of the course may be such that the return on your investment doesn't justify it. For example, if you want to incorporate more formative assessment into a small seminar course capped at eight students who all attend locally, you can probably do this more easily through paper-based and in-person exercises. Blended approaches tend to be more cost-effective as the number of students grows, the students grow more diverse or physically dispersed, or digital technologies open up possibilities that simply aren't available with analog or in-person methods. Blended learning is daunting because it requires a lot of what you might call startup costs. That is, the heavy investment of time needed to find or develop digital materials and to work out how you're going to incorporate them into your course. There are ways to mitigate or manage these startup costs, however. First, and most importantly, don't reinvent the wheel. Wherever possible, find digital resources you can use as is or tweak to fit your needs. The last slide in this video suggests some places to look. Second, there is absolutely no rule, and I repeat, no rule that says you have to blend an entire course all in one go. Start with the one or two things that would provide the greatest return on your investment. For example, if you want to create interactive quizzes or instructional video, start with a couple that focus on concepts or procedures that students struggle with most, and then create a few more each time you teach the class. Or, embrace an iterative design approach. Maybe the first time you will use ready-made materials and then customize or tweak them for the next iteration based on student feedback. There's a concept in software design called live beta that is particularly applicable here. Basically, once software designers began developing online platforms that supported thousands of users interacting in multiple ways at any given time, it became impossible to adequately test the software in-house. A live beta is a software version that is still in development but publicly released so that it can be tested in real-world conditions. Think of your first experiments with blended learning as live betas. The only way to truly work, learn what works, is to try, out, try it out with students in a course. That means you're always going to be using things that are half-baked or not completely perfect.
Just as there's no rule that say, says you must blend the entire course at once, there is no rule that says that you have to do all of the work yourself. Crowdsource your materials design by having students create quiz questions or instructional videos. If you have them use a collaborative platform like Quizlet or YouTube, which they're probably already familiar with, they can share materials directly with each other and you can save them or import them into your LMS for future use. Designing quiz questions or filming a worked example of a problem forces students to retrieve and process the material and to practice thinking metacognitively about what information is vital and what isn't for a particular learning class task. If you don't get the quality or the kinds of materials you want, going over what's helpful and what's not helpful in class can help improve them for the next iteration. Similarly, if your departmental colleagues are also interested in incorporating digital assessments, projects, or resources into their courses, you can crowdsource development by jointly building and sharing libraries of digital materials. Finally, consider hiring a technical TA to help with development and perhaps the first iteration of your blended course. A TA can help you find or build materials, test them, give you feedback from a student's perspective, develop login instructions, and help students with technical issues during the course. One of the big, biggest time-saving tips is to use existing resources. Videos, interactive materials, online homework systems, pre-built platforms for, created, for creating project websites, etc., etc. So how do you find these things? If you're looking for interactive materials and you use a textbook, check to see if the publisher has supplemented supplemental digital resources you could use. These might be materials that are bundled with the instructor version of a book that you can upload into your LMS, your learning management system, such as Moodle or Blackboard or Canvas, or they might be available through a standalone digital platform that students subscribe to. Check Con with contacts in your fields, your listservs, and on your discipline's professional association website, see if they're, they have materials that they can recommend or if they're, uh, they have curated an online collection of online materials. Check open educational repositories like Merlot and OER Commons that index resources in a number of fields and allow faculty pre to review them. Another useful site is TED-Ed, which allows users to build lessons around YouTube videos and then share those lessons with others, or build on lessons shared by others. Your college's educational technology support staff are a good source of information on the kinds of tools other faculty are using, the kinds of tools students are familiar with, and good tools or sources for particular needs. As a last resort, you can recreate paper-based activities, worksheets, and quizzes in digital form using built-in quiz features and tools for student collaboration and peer feedback in your LMS. This can be extremely time-consuming, but it's not difficult. You or your educational technology support staff could easily train a TA or a student who has taken your course to do much of the data entry.